So everyone here is probably familiar with the whole left brain, right brain thing. It's like either you're one or the other. Well, this artwork kind of spits in the face of that because it's a wood burning, but it's not made by human. It's made by a robot. And this robot, I created it a couple years ago in my garage. And it just is anybody curious about how it does it? OK. So you probably lit a match before. And with that match, you probably put it to a piece of paper. And you watch it like move. And you'll see there's like this brown part and in between like the clean paper and, and where the flame is. Well, what the robot is able to do, it actually can respond so quickly to the burning of the wood that it can control the actual burning. So it's not, it's like in between it burning and not burning. So it never catches on fire, it's just burning just enough. And when I, before I made this robot, I was, you know, just like, I had no idea I was gonna make robots to begin with. But like, I was originally mostly a left brain person. And I had no experiences with the arts anyway or fashion. And what this speech, this talk is about, is how I went from the left brain to the right brain. And now I kind of live in between the two, where you know, my passion is making these robots that are more like people. And so I, I, my, I never really followed my passion because I had no idea what that was. And I'm like most people where you know, everyone asks me, what is it you want to be when you grow up? And I kind of just responded to them and saying, oh, yeah, I want to be this or that, you know, have everyone else. And then when I went to college, I went the same kind of path where I'm really good at math and science. And so that's what I'm going to pursue. I'm simply going to pursue nothing else but that. And I became really good at chemistry. And it's so good that I actually was doing chemical research at the college I was at. And that chemical research was in nanochemistry. And I was trying to find a way to take the catalytic properties of, of, of platinum and recreate it with using the most abundant forms of elements on Earth. So that way it'd be very cheap because platinum's expensive. And then I also thought about going to medical school. And so probably like a year and a half before I graduated from college, I'm sitting there looking at applications from medical school and I'm thinking, oh yeah, you know, okay, this college and that college. And so I started to get a lot of anxiety. And I couldn't figure out why that was. And as graduation got closer and closer, I became more and more anxious. I, I just, it was so, it was like torturous almost. And then eventually I needed to figure out what was causing that. And I asked myself a very simple question. Is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? Do you want to become a doctor? And I had everything for it. You know, I was telling everybody I was going to become that. And I simply said to myself, no, this is not what I want to do. And that was the moment I realized I had a really difficult choice to make. And that choice was if I wanted to be happy, what I needed to do was stop everything. And so with only a year and a half left in college, I dropped out of college. The job I had was a pretty good, well-paying job. I quit that. Uh, my parents were kind of thrilled about this decision. <laughs> and you know, so I just cleared the slate because I was like, I'm lost. I don't know what it is I'm doing. And so the next thing I did, I don't know why I did it, is I got in my car and I drove around the country. And I kept a journal. And when I was writing in this journal, all that writing started to turn into drawings. And for the first time, I actually did art. Because if you're really good at math and science early on in life, nobody will ever tell you, hey, why don't you give art a try? True. Yeah. And so for the first time I was doing art and I was like, wow, I was actually really, really happy doing it. And, and first of all, I, didn't have, I had no idea I could actually draw. And I'm making all these like, very intricate drawings and everything. And by the time I ended my travels around the country, I ended up in South Carolina at a friend's house. I moved in with him. And what I did is I got these really large sheets of paper, of drawing paper, real fine, nice stuff. And I put them out on the floor and there was this about 10 feet by 7 feet is how it measured out. And I saw in my mind for the first time this drawing. 
And I was like, I'm gonna make this drawing I have in my head. And it turned out it took nine months to actually make this drawing because it was enormously detailed. And it's all done in ballpoint pen. You can't really see it all that well in this picture, but if anybody here would like to see it in person, because trust me, seeing it in person is like really interesting. You know, get in touch with me, I'll be fine with doing that. So when I made this, this pen drawing, uh, only guy, I kept the pens, and if you were to add up how much pen it would be, like draw a straight line and measure it out, it'd be 411 miles of pen. And so I started showing it around town because I wanted to get it you know, exhibited and so people see it and everything. It was my first artwork. I'm like, oh yeah, it's so cool. And eventually it got noticed by the McCall Center for Visual Art. And they're like, hey, we really like your artwork. We're gonna do the show about drawing. We would like your artwork to be the centerpiece of it. And I was like, oh, yeah, great, you know? And so it, it, they, they bring it in and everything and like a month before the show, they get in touch with me and they're like, oh, you have an artist's statement. And I was like, um, yeah, I'll get you one by the end of the week. I actually went online and Googled artist statement because I have no idea what they were talking about. I was like, yeah, I'll figure it out, you yeah. know? And so, you know, I read a few and they were kind of like, whoa, I'm like, okay, I can just. <laughs> but then when it, it was being exhibited at the McCall Center, it was so well received that people were like, oh, this is so cool because it had so much detail in it. People were actually look, staring at it and believing they were seeing things inside it. They would look at the bark of that tree and go, is there something in there? Or did you purposely draw that? It was just like going on and on. And what they did is they invited me into their artist residency program. And I was like, cool, this is great. I have no idea what this is, but sure, I'll do it. And what I later found out was, it's like the Andy Warhol Foundation rates this as the second best artist residency program in the nation. And I just like stumbled into it. And I'm like, oh, perfect. And while I was there, I was having like the greatest time because I met different artists and everything. And we were talk I was learning more about art than anything you know, from them. So I was always asking them questions and they feeling free to send me all this stuff. And then I was experimenting with different mediums. I was like, I was like screen printing Vaseline on the like glass and I was like dipping it into these different chemicals to get these weird etchings and everything. So I was having a great old time. Not only that, but I started selling artwork. And I was like, yeah. you know, it was like a chin. <laughs> but there's one problem. Um, these pen drawings, they take a very long time to make. This one was nine months. And so if I did even smaller ones, they could take two weeks, you know, a month or something. So I sold all of them. And then, you know, I had no artwork to sell. And so I was trying every little thing I could to sell artwork. And this became a problem for me because there's this new thing I really, really love. And all of a sudden, technically, I can't make a living off of it because I just won't, I'm not able to make enough artwork in the time period it's needed to make a stable living. So I was basically drinking one night. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, basically a couple more new things. But it, 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 at some point I kept thinking about this question, like how can I like fix this problem? Because it's just like, it's too big of a problem. I gotta keep doing this. And then eventually it's like, it, like the whole, idea just like appeared to me. It was like manna from heaven. It just came right down. I was like, oh my God, I got it all figured out. All I'm going to do is I'm going to make a robot and it's going to do all the work for me. <laughs> and I'm not kidding about this. Like I was like, I was, I started drawing on the wall of like crayons. It's like, this is the idea. Like it was a whiteboard and everything. I was like, I got it all figured out. And at that moment, it was like this, this great, like amazing feeling in my brain because like every little part of my brain was like, you like, like, they activated. Like, there was the engineer part, there was the artist part, the imagination part, the whole, and it, 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 everything just like lit up. I was like, it makes sense now. But there's this also this other part I completely forgot all about, was like my entire childhood has kind of like prepared me for this because my dad had a construction company and he had all kinds of different machines and everything. And what I did is I, you know, on the weekends and whatever, like, machines break down, you know. And he had like backhoes, you know, excavators, those are things that go like this, and bulldozers and everything. And I was always in that garage with him, working on these machines, taking them apart, you know, the, fixing their transmissions. Believe it or not, like the transmissions of machines like break down all the time because they're always pushing such the earth. So, I mean, they kind of. <laughs> and anyway, so I learned all this different stuff. And sometimes some of these machines were so old, he, you couldn't find parts for them. So he taught me how to make stuff on a lathe. And so I was able to put these parts 
into the machine, and he just showed me, like, oh, we can just make this on a lathe and just put it right in the machine, it'd be perfectly fine. Okay. So eventually I made this robot called Michael. And robot, uh, Michael is the robot who made the wood burning. And what's unique about Michael, he's completely made out of stuff you'll get from Home Depot. He's, the pulleys on him are from your garage door. The, the metal is the trim that you use in your house, and wherever there's metal in your house, pretty much you got it in. And he's made from two by fours. And he's like the metal, he's like the ductile work and all kinds of stuff. He, or I call it he, the robot, but you know. This is his first time doing a painting. He's never meant to do that. Um, this is at Gallery 22. And he, for an entire month, kept going like this, like doing a little bit of paint, going over here and just like dabbing it over and over. And he made this skull, has like 36,000 dots on it. And he did it over the course of like four weeks. And this, is the, this is what I really like about this machine. But he may have its crude type of look, but the last show I had was that uh, it had 48 works of art. Michael made those in about eight hours. So he's this industrial art making machine. And Michael has been this kind of like epiphany about my life. Like all the different things that I have, the art and everything just come together as one machine. I've never been happier with him. He actually lives in my living room right now, or you know, my girlfriend calls it the garage, but it is my living room. <laughs> and, uh, and now, Michael is like actually graduated. A year later from when this picture is taken, he's actually a more powerful machine. His software is even more capable than it was before. And anybody in the world will be able to connect to Michael at the end of the year and commission him. So now I went from a point where I can't make enough art to where a machine is actually able to make art where it could satisfy you know, a pretty good demand. And not only that, but by the end of the year, or a little bit more in the middle of, the, of next year, Michael's gonna be joined by other machines, other robots who are far more capable in what they're able to do. And what was interesting for myself was I was missing a piece of software. So I went out to these two gentlemen, their names are Oscar and John, and I said, hey, you got this, this software that can do like finances and everything. I need that, because I have this robot. I wanna make art that can be commissioned online and anybody in the world can do it. And they're like, oh, well, what's your pitch, in a sense? And I was like, uh, um, my pitch would be like, bring your Instagram and Facebook on your wall. And they're like, that's a really great idea. We can do that. But let's sweeten the deal a little bit. How about you come on as partner to our technology company? You can make robots, design robots, do all those different things. And ever since then, I've never been happier. Because now every day I think about these machines. And it turns out like my passion in life is making robots that make art. And sort of the kind of the lesson that I learned from it is that when you're like a little kid and everyone's asking you, oh, figure out, or they're asking you like, what is it you want to be when you grow up or whatever it is, you know, they're always like, it's cute. Just stop that. Now, I will no longer do that anymore. So what I ask kids or say to them is simply just figure out what you don't want to do. Because that's going to leave you with so many more options of what life is and let you explore that it's going to be fun and interesting. And hopefully they listen. But, but that's it for me.